Hey guys, it's Liam and Blake from Redefine Horizons, and there was a post uh, that I commented on a couple days ago on LinkedIn. It showed a new machine that sets porous curb and gutter uh, without any surveyor sticks or without any string line. And I had a little back and forth. It was a short, pleasant conversation with the equipment vendor uh, that, that sells those machines. And it, it got me to thinking about something that I've thought about for a long time. And so I wanted to do a little video that explains some of the some of the interesting implications of that technology for surveyors and design engineers and for project owners too. Um, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time, maybe 10 years. Um, so a couple disclaimers right here at the front. Um, this technology has taken a lot longer to impact the way we construct things in the United States than I thought. So some of the technology that we're just now seeing, I thought we were going to see five years ago or even 10 years ago. So it's taken, it's taken a lot longer than I thought. Um, another disclaimer, I don't work in construction on a regular basis. Um, it's just not what I do. I do a different kind of surveying. I, I, I'm typically on the land planning, uh, topo, uh, boundary, side of things, land title side of things. So I'm, I'm involved a little earlier in the project in the design phases. So I'm not doing construction every day. Uh, so that's a caveat, uh, disclaimer for you. Uh, but I have thought a lot about this and I think it's a really important topic for, it is important for surveyors for, for some business reasons, but it's really important for civil engineers and architects, people that, that design projects that then get built using this technology. So, that's part of the reason I wanted to put this video together. So, um, I guess the takeaway from those disclaimers is, uh, you know, I'm imperfect. <laughs> I'm not a wizard. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball that lets me see the future. You know, I made some predictions about this technology that turned out not to be true. Um, and I, I, I'm not working with this stuff day to day, but, uh, I have thought a lot about it and I am a licensed surveyor uh, and I have done some construction work in the past. So, what I want to do in this video is uh, I'm just going to real briefly go over the three basic types of uh, technology that are changing the way we build projects in the United States. And I'm primarily talking about site design. So I'm not really focused in this video on what happens inside of the building. Um, I'm, I'm talking more about the heavy construction part. So that's for infrastructure projects like pipelines, roads, levees, highways. Um, but some of this also applies to site design. Uh, so the heavy work that gets done to grade the site, install underground utilities, that type of thing. So <clears throat> let me talk briefly about the basically the three types of technology that are, are changing the way that we build projects in the United States. And th that technology goes under some different names. Sometimes it's called stakeless grading or machine control. Uh, I'm probably just going to use the, I'm going to use the, the term stakeless construction for the purposes of this video because that kind of encompasses all that. So let me just explain briefly for those that don't know uh, the whole kind of the old way of doing things and then I'll talk about the basically the three types of stakeless construction technology and then we can talk about some of the implications of that technology. So in the old days um, a surveyor would go out and he would set a bunch of stakes uh, so wood hubs or nails and what we call a lath, that's what people actually think of when they hear stakes. Um, the, the surveyor would basically lay out the design of the site on the ground, and he would actually write information on the stakes and give information to the contractor. The contractor would then use those stakes to build whatever the civil engineer and architect had envisioned for the, for the particular project. So it was a very manual, labor-intensive process, and in essence what the surveyor did is he he took a set of paper plans, construction plans, design plans, and he physically laid those plans out on the ground so that whatever was being designed, whatever was designed could actually be built, physically built. And there was a, a lot of interplay between the surveyor and the design team and the contractor. Um, like I said, it was a very labor intensive process. <clears throat> and so that, that's was the old way of doing it. You actually had a surveyor on site, um, physically setting wood, <laughs> typically wood, 
uh, wood wood mark markers on the ground so that the contractor can build build the site. And the contractor would do some of his own layout, obviously, but he didn't do a lot. Uh, basically, if the contractor couldn't pull it with a tape measure, um, the surveyor took care of it. Um, you know, there was uh, on some jobs you get a grade setter, run a hand level, and then a little later on you had some contractors run their own laser levels, but. Basically, the surveyor was responsible for most of the layout on the site, especially horizontal layout, uh, especially horizontal layout. So what's changed that? There's three kinds of technology that basically change that, that enable or allow uh, trenchless, or excuse me, stakeless construction. So I'm going to just list those for you over here on the board. Okay, so the first thing we had um, was we had uh, what I call GPS machine control. So that's essentially where they stick GPS receivers on the blade of a piece of heavy equipment. Okay, so it could be a, a dozer, a scraper, a grader, motor grader. Uh, they've got them now for buckets of excavators. Okay, and basically you would load a digital surface model into the piece of equipment. There's some onboard software and essentially the equipment I don't want to quite say it, it drove itself, but it greatly assisted the the uh, equipment operator uh, with the layout uh, of, of the site uh, and essentially eliminated the, the need for what surveyors call rough grade sticks. Okay. So this was kind of the first iteration. Now the problem with this, there's some problems with this technology, some limitations. I shouldn't say problems, some limitations. One is uh, it doesn't work good in urban canyons and in sites with a lot of tree cover because you have multi-path issues with the GPS signals and Typically, even with an on-site base, what we call an on-site base station, the vertical accuracy here isn't very good. It's plus or minus a couple tenths. So good enough for what, what surveyors call rough grade, uh, but it's not good enough for what we call finished grade. In other words, you can't pour concrete with it. Okay, so the second thing they came out with was essentially GPS machine control. plus what I call GPS machine control plus. And what's the plus? Basically they added a laser level. And so what this does is it, it eliminates some of the uh, issues with vertical accuracy that you have with just machine control. So now you've got the GPS receivers on the blade, uh, but you've also got an additional laser level somewhere on the site that provides better vertical accuracy, but actually pretty good vertical accuracy. Um, so this is kind of iteration number two. Yeah, you still have some of the issues with site conditions, urban canyons, and and tree cover here that can mess with your GPS. Um, and, you know, your horizontal on this is still probably plus or minus a tenth. Um, it's good enough for rough grade and good enough for a lot of finished grade, but not all finished grade. Okay. So here's kind of the last iteration, and that's essentially uh, the use of robotic total stations. And that's... It's really just the same instrument that a land surveyor uses when he comes out to do the manual construction staking. That's the same equipment, essentially. And instead of having GPS receivers mounted on the blades of the machines, uh, now you essentially have what we call 360 degree prism. Okay. That's basically mounted on all the equipment and that's tracked by one or more robotic total stations. And this stuff can get really, really good. I mean, essentially, this could be almost as good as having a land surveyor do your layout. This is the same equipment. Okay, so essentially what happens here is rough grade staking goes away here on number one. And number two kind of finishes off whatever rough grade staking was left, plus allows the contractor to do some of his own finished grade staking. And then finally number three, number three essentially eliminates the need for a land surveyor on the site, basically. Um, I think surveyors are still laying out grid lines for buildings and probably columns for bridges, similar structures, but that's about all we have left. And I think the, the amount of time we're doing that is actually limited. So this is the three kinds of technology that I basically encompass in stakeless construction. Now there's some good things and some bad things about this. So what are the good things? You know, the good thing is uh, it's going to get a lot cheaper to build projects because you don't have to pay for a land surveyor to do all your staking. You know, and I, I'm gonna be completely honest, like land surveyors are expensive, uh, they're cranky, they drink too much, uh, they're generally a pain in the butt, you know, they melt in the rain. So there's a lot of reasons why contractors um, 
see the benefit in this technology. And it's, it's not just the, there's no secret campaign to get rid of surveyors. I don't think that's what's going on. Um, this technology saves time and money, and, it, and it's not just the time and money that's saved by eliminating the surveyor. It actually, and I've written about this before, it actually makes the, the laborers and the equipment operators on the construction site more productive. So there's a lot of advantages to this technology. So in the, in the end, what this does is it makes uh, projects cheaper to build. And that's better for everybody. As projects are cheaper to build, we'll build more stuff. Um, that's, that's a good thing, as a general rule. So what are some of the problems with this technology? Well, essentially what we've done with this technology is we've taken the surveyor off of the job site. And that hasn't happened completely yet, but we're very close. And so that has some huge implications. It has some huge implications for the design engineer and project owner. And of course it has some business implications for land surveyors. I don't want to talk about the business implications for land surveyors in this video because I don't want the video to go too long. But I do want to talk about what some of the implications are for the design teams and the project owners because I think those are important. And here's the point that I was making to the gentleman from the equipment vendor that I was going back and forth with on LinkedIn. Um, equipment vendors have an incentive to sell this technology. That's how they make their money. So uh, there's always exceptions to the rule, but I believe in my experience, a lot of times those vendors aren't always being upfront with their clients about uh, the implications of this technology and the risk that it carries. Um, and certainly they're selling the technology to the contractor. And this technology, although I, I believe it does create some additional risk for the contractor, it's really creating additional risk for the design, the design team and the project owner, so the architect, the engineer, and the project owner. So we've got a situation where we've got a business selling technology to a contractor uh, when that there's all kinds of advantages to that technology, but it, it doesn't create all the risks and liability associated with that change. They don't accrue to the contractor, and they certainly don't accrue to the equipment vendor. It accrues to the design team and the project owner. So there's a there's a misalignment to some extent of, of some incentives there. And I, I, I don't trust that equipment vendors are always honest with the uh, architecture and engineering and construction community about that trade-off. So it's part of the reason why I wanted to do this video. So let's talk about the implications of this for a design team. This is the most important part of the video, I think. <clears throat> and, and here's what I want. I want architects and, and engineers to understand this is really important what I'm about to talk about. And I think, I think design professionals underestimate the importance of what I'm about to say. I'm going to draw a little diagram. Um, and I've talked to engineers and architects before. I haven't done it enough. This isn't really my business. This is not what I do. I don't do construction staking for a living. It's not how I make my money. Um, but I do think it's really important. So here's what I want you to remember. Right now, this is the design for the project, okay? And over here is the bulldozer. All right, I'm gonna draw kind of a cheesy bulldozer here, so bear with me, but you know, something like this. Okay, in the old days, something stood in between the design and the bulldozer, okay? And that was a lancer here. Okay, so the design went to the land surveyor, okay, from the design team, and then the surveyor reviewed the plans, did some calculations, he did the layout, and then the contractor built the job. The bulldozer started rolling, okay? Now, what a lot of people don't realize, including design professionals and contractors, is a huge amount of work happened here in this middle phase, right? So generally at the start of a construction job, I would take the whole set of plans. I might spend, I could spend days with a set of plans, just going through every sheet of the plans, getting prepared for the initial calculations, and the huge amount of calculations that take place. And I would argue, and I've said this before, that by the end of a project, a land surveyor knows that plan set better than anybody else. He knows it better than the contractor, and he knows better than any of, of the disciplines that were involved on the, on the design team. And, and a lot of people don't realize what happens, frequently what happens on a set of design plans like this. You know, so we've got the design team here. And that those design teams are multidisciplinary. 
Okay, so for example, on a, on a typical uh, transportation project, okay, you, you're going to have a civil. So you might have a civil engineer. Sorry, civil. Civil engineer that's doing some of the design. Then you might have a structural engineer. He's doing some of the design. Maybe he's designing the bridges. Civil's designing all the fill and the pavement. Okay. Then you might have a another engineer who's handling the design of the utilities. Okay. Then you might have another. Uh, you know, you might have a landscape architect. Okay. Then sometimes you got a traffic engineer. He's designing the signals. Okay. So you have all these different all these different disciplines. Okay. And their sheets just go into a plan, <laughs> a set of plans. And a lot of times, these guys aren't talking to each other like they should. And many times, there's not really one person that sits up here at the top that makes sure that all these disciplines are working together and that their designs mesh. Okay, so who is that? Well, in the traditional model, that was me. That was a land surveyor. You know, I would find conflicts between the civil's plan and the structural plans, and I'd get them both on the phone, and I'd say, hey, we got to figure this out because the contractor's ready to build on Monday. And this doesn't work. Your guys, your design's conflict, or I don't have enough information. Okay, and there was even a name for that process, formal process called request for information. Okay. So what I want you to understand is, in the when we go to stakeless construction, this guy's gone. The license surveyor's gone. You guys, you guys fired me. Okay, so now the design is moving directly from the design team straight into the bulldozer. And that, like, I mean that literally. Like, they, they put the design on a USB stick and they go over and they plug it into this thing. So there's a huge amount of QAQC that used to be happening here. Okay? By a licensed professional with professional liability insurance and he's gone. You guys fired him. Okay? So there's way more risk now on these construction projects. Yeah, everybody's saving money and it's faster. And, and it's not going to stop. Surveyors aren't going to change it. Um, I think it's a good thing for society as a whole and for our economy. But I think people fail to appreciate the, the huge ramifications of the elimination of this licensed professional here with, with insurance coverage that stood between the design and the bulldozer. And I, I don't think everybody appreciates the major coordination role that the surveyor played here at the top of the design team, getting all these disciplines to work together and to hash out the constructability issues in the plan sets. So there's a bunch more risk created. Where does that risk go? Let's think about that for a minute. And then I want to talk to you about what I think architects and design, uh, civil engineers and, and design teams in general, what can they do to help mitigate this risk? Because they shouldn't have to take all the risk on and not be compensated for it, right? Everybody's going to save money, the project owner, the contractor, the equipment vendor, they're going to make their money. So the design team, if, if your project is being built with stakeless construction, you have way more liability and you should be compensated for that risk and you should also have the opportunity to mitigate some of that risk during construction. We'll talk about how you can do that. Okay. But let's talk about where that risk went for a minute. Okay. So here's the old, the old system. Okay. And uh, I'm just going to keep this math simple. Okay, so we're going to simplify things a little bit. Uh, but over here, we've got the design team. Okay, then we've got the surveyor. And over here, we have the construction team. Okay, and essentially, you could just say they split the liability for things going wrong on construction projects three ways. Okay, and, you know, the math didn't always pan out that way, but um, just to keep things simple. So, for example, if there was a $300,000 claim on a construction project, Maybe the design team paid for 100K of that, the surveyor paid for 100K of that, and the contractor, maybe he took 100K of that. You know, or maybe it was the, the surveyor marked the stakes wrong and he, he took all 300K. Or it could be the surveyor, the design was good and the surveyor stakes were right and the contractor messed something up and so the contractor takes all 300K. But as a general rule, there's some shared responsibility, okay? And so there's this, the cost of the change order, the claim get, gets a portion between those three those three parties. Now, here's what we just did. Remember, you fired me, so I'm gone now. Okay, so now we got the same 300 grand. Okay, just in this example. Okay, but I'm not here to take it anymore. Okay, so where does it go? And here's the problem. It's going to be more than 300 grand in our example, because now you no longer have the QAQC being performed by the surveyor. Well, there's going to be more problems. 
in construction. So this just went up. It's not 300 grand anymore. It's 400 grand. It went up by 25%. Okay. Well, here's what I don't think the design team realizes. The bulk of this enhanced risk is going to come down here to the design team. One of the reasons that's true is because you guys no longer have a licensed surveyor there checking your design, making sure that the contractor doesn't make mistakes, and defending your work, right? So there's a lot of kind of coordination and dispute resolution that the land surveyor used to do. I'm not there anymore. So you, not only are you going to take on more of this enhanced risk, but you're going to spend a lot more time during construction going back and forth with the contractor. Okay, You guys are going to fight with the contractor more. That used to be my job. Right? I used to fight with contractors all the time. Not that and there are good contractors, there's bad contractors too. And no matter what, on a job, there's constructability issues. And so the surveyor used to play a role in getting those resolved, and I'm not there anymore. Okay? So that has huge implications, I think. So what can you do if you're a design team to mitigate some of that risk? Okay? Well, first of all, before we talk about what you can do to mitigate the risk. First of all, you need to have a conversation with your project owner, design teams. If your project's going to be built with stakeless construction methods, uh, you need to get paid more, period. Right? Uh, because you're taking on more risk and the client's going to save money uh, by building a project without stakes. Okay? But aside from that, aside from being compensated more for your additional risk, there's some things that you need to get into your contract with the owner to mitigate your risk during construction. And it, now, the owners aren't going to want to do that. I, sh I should rephrase that. Some owners aren't going to want to do that because they're not going to want to spend the money. Good, good project owners will. But you need to understand, you, you need to get this into your contracts. You need to contractually get a role for yourself in the construction management of the project so that you can help mitigate some of these risks. So here's some suggestions, some things you could do. And again, I don't do this type of work. Okay, So this is a... This is a public service announcement here. I, I don't have a, I don't have a financial incentive here. With what this is like, this is from the heart. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to help architects and civil engineers. Okay, so what can you do if you got a, a project that's being done with stakeless grading? Okay, the first thing you need to do is you need to move to 3D design. And let me tell you why that's important. A lot of problems can hide on a set of 2D design plans. A lot of problems. It's a lot harder to hide those problems when you're actually moving to 3D design. What do I mean by that? I mean, you actually build a 3D model of the improvements on the site. Okay, whether you're doing that in SketchUp or AutoCAD Civil 3D or Revit or whatever the software platform is. Okay, but you actually have to design in 3D. Okay, and that takes more time and it costs more money. But here's what you have to remember. If you're a design team and you're still designing on 2D plans, the very first thing the contractor does when you get your plans is he creates his own 3D model of the improvements because he needs that for the machines. So either you're going to do it, and you're going to get paid to do it, and you're going to get paid to do it right, or you're going to do a 2D set of plans and the contractor is going to get paid to do it, and there's a good chance he's going to mess it up and he doesn't have your back. Okay, so you've got to design in 3D. Second, you need to have a surveyor review your plans. Okay. Pay a land surveyor to do a constructability removal of your plants. Pay me to do the same thing that I used to do, only I'm not setting wood in the ground, right? And that is go through every sheet of the plans and look for issues. Is there enough information in the plans to realistically create an accurate 3D model? Where are the problem areas? Do you guys have to fill out of the right away? Are there places where the utilities don't work? You know, you've got a, a dry utility line running through a storm drain. Um, surveyors can help you with that. They can just help with the basic constructability of the plans, the phasing, which what gets built first and in what order. Okay. Pay a surveyor to do this. Or if you have surveyors in-house and they're no longer staking, instead of staking, they should be helping you review your plan sets. Three, and I think this is really important, get the owner to put in your construction management contract the survey control and get paid to do that throughout the life of the project. So your surveyor design team should be setting and maintaining primary control throughout the construction project. That's the control the contractor is going to set up on to run his stakeless construction. Okay. And there's all kinds of issues that go in go into that. I'll just tell you right now, 99% of contractors are, are not qualified to set primary control on a construction site. 
that needs to be done by a surveyor and it needs to be done by your surveyor, okay? You're gonna eliminate a lot of problems, potential conflicts with the contractor if you've got your surveyor setting the survey control and keeping it maintained. So get that in your construction contract. Four, you need to have an enhanced role for as-built and checks on layout during construction. Now, you're not gonna get paid as-built everything but what you need to do is you need to sit down and have a conversation with the owner and the contractor. And you need to decide what are the critical elements of your design. You know, what's gonna, what's, if something gets put in the wrong spot, either horizontally or vertically, there, there are elements of a design that are gonna really, really screw things up if they get put in the wrong spot. So, you know, no big deal if you get a vegetated swale a few feet in the wrong spot. You could probably, you can work around that. But, you know, you put a building in the wrong spot on a tight site, you're gonna have problems. So what are those critical elements? And then you need to have your surveyor, not the contractor's grade setter, your surveyor is part of the construction management contract, needs to be checking the layout of those items before concrete gets poured. And you need to be providing as built. And to some extent, surveyors are already doing that. This is what pad certs are, form certs, that kind of thing. But there needs to be an enhanced role for that kind of QAQC and as built process. And see, part of what you're doing here, you're preventing problems before they start, number four. Okay. What you're also doing is you're pulling back in the licensed land surveyor into this process. You're pulling him back in and you're pulling his insurance policy back in, right? Which is what you want to do. Okay. Now, let's just talk for a minute about another issue. And that this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Um, I don't have a problem with contractors doing their own construction layout. As long as they do it right. And the problem we have is, is a lot of them don't do it right. So if you're a contractor and you're going to do your own layout, uh, I think there's some rules of thumb that you need to follow. Okay, so I'm going to just list those. Um, I think the best thing for a contractor to do is to hire their own surveyor. And I'm not talking about like go get your low bid guy, right? But like have a person either on your staff or somebody that you have a relationship with, a good surveyor that can teach your people how to do what I'm about to talk about, okay? And, and can work with you to make sure things are done right. Because even though there's a large chunk of liability for the design team, you also, you, you start running stakeless construction as a contractor, I believe you're also, you're taking on more liability. Um, and by the way, you need to make sure that kind of work is covered in your, your under your insurance too, because it might not be. So, a couple things you need to do, contractors, Number one, you need to learn to take care of your equipment. Okay. This survey gear that you guys are buying, the GPS and the total stations, that is not like the rest of your tools that you get to beat the crap out of. These are finely tuned, uh, highly precise instruments, and they need to be coddled and taken care of. You gotta keep them out, you gotta keep them clean, you gotta try and protect them from the dust, the rain, and the heat. Uh, you can't throw them around the back of your truck. You know, if they fall over, they, 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 they got to be looked at. Um, you know, and that equipment also needs to be regularly calibrated and checked. That's something that land surveyors are doing. Okay, so take care of your gear, understand how your tools work. Number two, you need to hire the right people. Okay, so if you got a guy that's doing layout for you, you know, you need to ask yourself some questions. He needs to know more than just how to push buttons on a piece of equipment you were sold by a vendor. Okay, so for example, you know, does he understand, I'm just gonna give you a list here. Okay, does he understand coordinate geometry? Okay, does he understand control methods? Does he understand Error propagation and adjustment and measurements. Um, you know, does he have some key math skills? Does he have algebra? Basic trig. Some elementary stats. Does he understand 
coordinate reference systems, datums, and you know, controlling benchmarks. Can you reset plans? Can you work in CAD? You know, your your layout guy, contractors, he needs to know some of this. And if he doesn't, you're setting yourself up for some major failures if you're not careful. You can't just grab your carpenter and throw him on a total station and think you have a surveyor. That's, that's not how this works. And design teams and project owners, you need to be asking yourself, if, you're, if your contractor is using stakeless construction, has he hired the right people? You know, does he take care of his equipment? More importantly, has he hired the right people? Do, do he, does he have people on his staff that know these things? So anyways, that was a, a long response to a short LinkedIn conversation, but I hope this helps some architects and some civil engineers, other members of the design team to understand some of the implications of stakeless construction and the extra liability that it can create for them. So appreciate you guys watching.